some ways my role on that day was to say, yes, we're going to keep going. And that was a really hard decision to make and I wasn't sure. And Perba actually said to me, he said, Diddy, the story's over now. And I said, no, Perba, this is the story. And that was hard because I felt like I was going against what he wanted. He said, but everybody, you know. And then he afterwards he said to me, I understand why you have to keep filming now. And that was very validating because, you know, I had been felt conflicted at the time. And, you know, we had a young data wrangler at base camp um, who was completely traumatised. Um, and, you know, we ended up getting him counselling after the fact. And But I think for the more hardened mountain hills among us, you know, who've seen death a lot. Um, and I haven't seen it so much in the mountains, but I've been very close to it when it's happened and in solo and other situations. There's a certain thing you just go, this is part of the gig. And I just had a very strong feeling that here we were, fully equipped, fully financed, making a film about the Sherpas. Now it was, it was um, time to keep going. I, I'll play this clip because it's probably, I think it's around the avalanche and then I think the point here that we could now talk about is just how to turn the story around, which is kind of what we're talking about anyway. So all sound design now. And the fact that he looked down like that just meant, ah, oh, this is, it's why we could kind of use that shot. Now, again, absolute kudos to the sound recordist who was, had only arrived at base camp, who was an Australian guy, Mick Emon, who had the wherewithal to find out what the rescue channel was and start recording it as quickly as possible. And that was with no direction from me. I mean, I asked him to record with us and he ended up staying with Renan for most of that day, but he was, while, while it was going on, he was recording all of this. So we had three, four hours of material we could go through and edit together. This guy here didn't want to be included, which is a pain in the neck, because he was in my shot. We had to edit around that. But what, what we did there, um, I mean, the whole how to handle the avalanche was such a tricky thing in the edit. Um, and I had shown, we had all these other shots where guys were like get, getting pummeled by stuff when a helicopter was taking off and different bits and pieces that we captured in other ways at other times. Um, and I'd kind of done this sort of montage thing and I had this great shot of the yak looking up at the icefall and, but the avalanche wasn't there. We're thinking, so should we CGI in the you know, avalanche? And in the end, I showed a rough cut to David Michaud and he said, um, pull all back, none of it feels real. Um, and then he said, and go and watch the lead up to the crash in Senna. I don't know if you guys have seen yeah. Senna. And it was um, where suddenly the sound and the music and the editing slowed right down um, and it felt different. And you didn't know quite what felt different, but you know that something's gonna, going wrong because suddenly there's a lot more silence and you know there's an unease. And, and so that idea came from him and so that breathing and I just think it was so effective. So I, you know, I sort of often wonder about that whether or not it was the right thing to do but the, I think the reason that we did it, and I'm trying to remember the conversations we had around it because we didn't actually initially have it um, and it was, um, in fact it was Justine Wright's idea, we had this amazing editor who edited Touching the Void come out and do a week with us because um, Universal wanted to know that there was someone with big feature doc experience. So we don't have many of those editors here. But in actual fact, she was just amazing. Um, and she and Christian got on so well. And it was just like having fresh eyes and, and someone throwing different ideas. We, we showed our very first rough cut, which was, you know, excruciating. Um, and then we went and had lunch. And then we just sat in the room and talked for the rest of the day. And then the next day, it was kind of rolled up the sleeves and, and had a bunch of notes of things we wanted to hit. And, and there were certain areas that were working really well and other areas that weren't, and we just hit them. And she'd say, and she'd, so she just sat on the couch and Christian was on the edit and, and then I was on my laptop. She's going, do you have anyone that says anything like, you know, with certain scenes around the protesting, it was very unclear what the Sherpas wanted and it was a really tricky 
thing to edit and she'd go, have you got anyone that says something like this? And I'm like, yes, I think. And I'd just go into my database of transcripts and go, here's something and boom, 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 boom. Then she, we'd try it again and she'd just sit there and watch it and there would be this just two minute silence. And then she'd go, okay, I reckon when he says that and then he says that, you should move that to there and then she'd just have her eyes closed. It was like she could just edit the thing in her head. It was remarkable. Yeah, so she was great. And so I think, I think it's funny, it's really un foggy now, but I think the reason that we did that was because it, we wanted that sense of foreboding. So when you meet those characters, you know something bad is going to go down. And it was just a sort of a dramatic tension device is probably the best way of explaining it. You know, we're dealing with Universal, who hadn't done many docos at that, feature docs at that time. And, you know, the lesson in that was to write this treatment as speculative you know, at the end of it, um, because they were suddenly saying, well, we wanted a film that went to the summit. And so then when we got back, we had to sort of essentially re-pitch the film. So as soon as I got back, um, I had, you know, four or five days off and I just slept the entire time. And then I just got back into the edit and started watching and viewing and had to rewrite all of the treatments and we cut them a beauty reel just to sort of, again, try and give them confidence that we got some beautiful material. And then we cut an example scene, which ended up being very similar to what ended up in the film of the avalanche and the aftermath, um, the aftermath. And just to show we had the drama and, and they ended up saying, OK, you know, we agree this is probably a stronger film and they went for it. Screen Australia, on the other hand, were just fully supportive, really supportive the whole way through. I think in this case, yes, and I'm realising that now working on the Mountain Project, um, that Bridget really kept me protected in that bubble that I would just went in every day. I didn't have any other distractions. She, I found out later she was just warding people away and not letting anyone in there to talk to me at all. And we just were in that room in lockdown, you know, nine, ten hours a day and sometimes Saturdays just working. Um, and but. So she sort of did all that and, and did a lot of the contracting and, and sorting everything out with Universal and, and that stuff. Um, John Smithson was more, turned out to be then the editorial producer. So he would, we'd send him cuts at a certain point. We then got on Skype and we had a regular routine that sort of, particularly towards the end, every probably third day, we'd be sending over a Vimeo link He'd watch it in the evening, he'd get up at 9 o'clock or whatever, we'd do a Skype, 6 o'clock in the edit suite to him, 9 o'clock, and we'd just, you know, talk it through. And at a certain point when we had a structural issue in the first act, he was coming out to Dubai for another project. I said, John, I'm sick of this, just get on a plane and come here and we'll wrestle it out in the edit suite. Because he said, I know it's not working. He had this idea that the fight should start the film. Um, like it had in the trailer, because it had worked so well in the trailer, he was convinced it was going to work, but it didn't. And we tried it, and it was people were just going, these Sherpas are nuts, and and we're really not liking the Sherpas. And it was because you had none of the context of the whole first act, which is that whole story of why it was. Oh, look, it, it actually worked really well, but when it really came to that, you know, he's really rigorous in edits, and he gets very involved, which I know some directors find really annoying. I don't, I don't mind being pushed. I just think everyone's idea is valid, and but but I would I'll stand and fight my corner, and I won that one eventually. Um, but it was only after we had Christmas break and everything, and and he rang up and he said, "There's a number of things we need to discuss. I think uh, you know we've got some big changes." And I said, Fuck, "I don't have the energy for this anymore," <laughs> and he said, "You were right." <laughs> and he'd obviously shown it to some people over the Christmas holidays. And I just said, "Oh, I love you. Thank you so much. I was just so happy."